Hey, welcome everybody. Douglas is just joining in. Uh, we are just warming up the, the audience and uh, having a little bit of a chit chat and setting up. Oh, you're at the cottage today, Squirrel. I am, yes. That is awesome. By the way, what was the year in which it was built? I know it's around some... 1450. We don't know exactly. Oh my God. And it's still standing up. Like that's we just had Kudos it fixed to this the summer. builders. Yes. The builders get a lot of credit. There's some um, beams up here that have Roman numerals on them, which uh, are the only evidence we have of the uh, the person who actually built the place. And um, uh, they show that, uh, you know, they would have laid out the beams on the ground, the Roman numeral one, two, three, four, to um, to put them up. <clears throat> so uh, that we, we really don't know anything about who built it or when, except um, that, that little that little clue. Yeah, that that's how they got paid the artists back then, right? Like they had to mark the the parts of the building they they were uh, installing or or building so that they would get paid. I'm not quite sure whether that's the case, but but I wasn't here, so uh, I can't tell you. Yeah, that that's at least how the castles were or the stone ah. masons were paid. Okay, uh, like yes, that's you, true. You would yeah, have to, to mark, mark your on. stone, yeah. and then they would go and count <laughs> yeah. the stones. That, that timber, not so much. I don't think anybody thought it would be here long enough to. Uh, <laughs> to have and to yet, do that. and yet here it is. So that's like around 570 years. That's amazing. It is. We're that, hoping that... to keep it around for that much longer. And and that talks to the permanence of uh, uh, good architecture. Yes, there you go. <laughs> and well, I knew uh, we'd course... get around to that at some point. Can you yeah. hear me? Okay, I've just switched microphone. Yeah, good. I can hear you fine. Glad it's all working. Yeah, and uh, we're, we're just warming up the uh, audience and the stream here. We will get started at the top of the hour, everybody. If you have questions, do send them on the chat so that we can, uh, of course, pass those up to to uh, Squirrel. Uh, Squirrel, who has uh, developed the community, uh, I think you call it Squidrel, Squirrel Squadron, right? Yeah, it's very hard to pronounce, especially if uh, um, uh, if Q isn't a, a common le letter in your language. Uh, oh. I, I don't know what I'm going to do when I get some Japanese people in, because they don't have the, letter, the sound Q at all. Um, but uh, yes, it's a tongue twister, but um, a lot of fun. We have 2,000 people from all over the world, uh, uh, tech and non-tech people working together. So that's squirrelsquadron.com. But uh, uh, happy to draw some examples there uh, from the community and uh, talk talk through them with you, Vasco. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, do, do check it out, squirrelsquadron.com, uh, and follow uh, Squirrel's work, which we are going to discuss uh, quite in depth here today. And even Excellent. give you some tools uh, that you might want to use to debug your agile conversations. Now, for, for while we wait for the, the right time to get started, this book is, uh, how old is it? Agile Conversations, we wrote it at the beginning of the pandemic. We had perfect timing. So uh, our book tour had to be completely canceled because nobody could um, stir out of their houses. So uh, it'll be, it's uh, three and a half now. All right. And uh, uh, one of the topics uh, has been, or conversations has been one of the topics also here with Judy Rees' uh, keynote on clean language that we had uh, mm, earlier. Yeah, good stuff. And uh, uh, Douglas, or Squirrel, as he likes to be called. You can call me either one. <laughs> and Jeffrey, his co-author, uh, uh, made a point of, of giving some concrete tools, and we'll explore that as, as we start Certainly the... Will. The, There's the book the for anyone's conversation. curious. I've there you go. Slightly, there you go. Slightly dog-eared. Sorry, I don't have a, a beautiful copy sitting right here. Well, that means it's used, right? That's how it goes. I was holding it up for a, a client earlier today. <clears throat> read this. Good. Read this chapter. You need it. And uh, so you do a lot of consulting work as well. And I, I just heard that uh, you were uh, out west on the other side of the uh, Atlantic Ocean for a while. I was. Well, we had to take apart one of these walls. Well, not me, but somebody who knows what they're doing had to take apart one of these walls and put it back together so the house would stay up, hopefully for another 600 years. And uh, so I escaped to North Carolina for uh, eight weeks, something like that. We were there a, a, a really long time. And how, how could you like put it together? Because I mean, you know, living in, in another country and it, of course, <laughs> even in another continent for such a long time, that, that must take some preparation. 
Uh, well, it wasn't so much preparation as just patience and uh, the willingness to get up early. So um, I, it's nice to be a consultant who controls one's hours, but uh, sometimes people in the UK or Europe needed me at a funny time of day. Um, so I, I did as that. They, as they usually do. As they often do, but uh, <laughs> I managed to control that to some degree, but very happy to be um, a little closer to uh, sanity. Um, uh, because I, I'm not a morning person, it's easier for me to stay up late, and I have plenty of West Coast U.S. clients who uh, do talk to me in the early evening, but that's okay. Uh, three in the morning was a bit more challenging. Yeah, that, I, I totally see that. Like, Of course, I, I have been working with the U.S. clients as well, and uh, we have the evening uh, long hours, not the, yep. the morning long hours. So. Definitely easier. I'll take that any day. <laughs> very good very good so everybody of course you can uh, check out uh, the book agile conversations by uh, squirrel and uh, frederick and uh, we'll put the link on the on the chat in a minute but also uh, if you want to send us questions uh, feel free the chat is open and uh, this is going to be a very relaxed conversation because at least I am nursing a bit of a cold. Uh, so I, I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to let uh, Squirrel bring his uh, usual energy and insights uh, for us. But of course, if you if you guys uh, listening and watching, if you have questions, don't hesitate to send those on the chat and we'll we'll make it uh, we'll, we'll transfer the questions. Make sure that uh, Squirrel hears those questions and of, has the opportunity. To, to answer those. Um, so anything interesting in your uh, consulting life recently? Oh That's my cool. heavens, so what did I pick up this morning? So it's been a very busy, very exciting morning. Um, let's see. Um, so I just got off the phone with a uh, client who has um, a tech team that uh, needs um, some leadership help. So uh, uh, helping with uh, leadership improvement is something I do all the time. So <clears throat> they said, we've, you've helped us, actually two different folks said, you've helped us in this area and now we need help in this area. So um, I, I never run out of opportunities to uh, help, help people improve the uh, communication and the emotional uh, maturity and capability of their technology teams. And usually it's not, the technology team needs a lot of improvement. <laughs> um, they, they do, but um, usually there's just as much to do with people who work with the technology team and helping them communicate better as there is with the, the engineers themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we do know, at least those of us who work in the role of Scrum Master, Agile Coach, or even Team Lead, Team Manager, we do know how conversations are important in, in uh, nursing the team's uh, motivation and focus and so on. And Definitely, that's a, a key skill for leaders, uh, wherever they are, whether they are part of the team or uh, somewhere in the organizational hierarchy. And uh, definitely uh, stay for uh, this conversation with Squirrel and then check out also Judy Rees keynote on uh, clean language. Uh, um, we, we do explore a lot how conversations happen, how to make them better, and uh, some of the tools that, that might be important for all of us working with teams. And when you say you work with the leadership uh, squirrel, can you give us a couple of examples? Like what, what are the kind of projects you usually uh, get up to with the oh, leaders man. in engineering the, organizations? The variety is huge. So um, uh, with one of those, I'm coaching um, the CEO and the CTO together. So um, they're, they're both getting the, the, the value of uh, advice from squirrel. And I do that not infrequently. Um, sometimes I'm working with a... Um, technological leadership group. So it might be the uh, CTO, the VP of engineering, the head of product, um, and a head of data, that sort of thing. So I'm in consortium coaching the group. Sometimes it's uh, individuals. So be the head of product or the um, uh, uh, VP of engineering or somebody like that <clears throat> who needs improved skills um, uh, and do strategy work for the whole company. So um, uh, one fun one was uh, the, the world's largest um, dating app for lesbians um, had me, That's a uh, niche. area an area that I, yeah well an area that I'm definitely not an expert in um, <laughs> had me come in and, and help with uh, with strategy for them we came up with some very uh, innovative new things to try 
and uh, some different approaches that really made a difference for them. Um, so a uh, wide variety of different groups, but that was that was with um, uh, the whole executive team. So, so we'll, we'll dive into some of the uh, challenges that Squirrel tackles on a regular basis uh, in his work as a consultant and coach in a minute. Uh, but uh, tease us a little bit, what are some of the key problems? We'll, we'll figure out the solutions later during this conversation, but what are some of the key problems you see in technology leadership in your work? Squirrel. Mm, fascinating. So um, just in no particular order, um, uh, lack of delivery, and that doesn't mean the engineering team isn't working hard, but they aren't um, delivering what customers need. need they aren't um, getting feedback quickly. When they do get feedback, it's the wrong feedback, and they act on it in an unhelpful way. So speed of delivery, uh, lack of delivery are is a very, very common symptom. Um, uh, misalignment. So the engineers are working, and I was just chatting to uh, an investor earlier for whom the, there's often this disconnect between very, very clever people, often quite technical in non-technical roles in, in um, deep tech companies. And those folks come along and say, uh, well, we have a wonderful new product and we're working on it and it's going to be amazing and it's going to revolutionize the industry. And the investor says, yeah, have you sold any? Oh, don't worry. Everyone will want it when we're finished. When will we be finished? Well, we're not sure. <clears throat> so yeah, that disconnect I... between the people paying the bills, what, what is it, the gold owners and the gold donors, um, the, the, the disconnect there is um, a, a really significant challenge. All right. So we'll we'll dive into that, some of those challenges and how uh, Agile Conversations, uh, the topic of the book that Squirrel and uh, Jeffrey Frederick wrote. Uh, we'll dive into that in a minute. Uh, first of all, welcome, everybody. Welcome to this session with uh, Douglas Squirrel. We will be talking about debugging Agile Conversations uh, in our work as coaches and, and Scrum Masters and leaders overall in the organizations we are uh, part of. And uh, uh, of course, don't forget, there's also other sessions at agileonlinesummit.com. There is um, uh, Judy Rees keynote, which I already mentioned uh, in the warm up, uh, which is a, a great keynote about the importance and, and how conversations shape the organizations and culture, which is actually the subtitle of your book. So first, welcome, uh, Squirrel. Welcome to our uh, Agile on Online Summit. Uh, tell us a little bit about you. Like what 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 made you want to uh, start working in this industry and, of course, eventually bump into the need of writing the book? Uh, so the um, I sort of stumbled into the industry. I started as a mathematician and um, really uh, started writing code for a living because I needed money for a wedding um, and uh, still very happily married to the same person many years later. So something worked there and I'm very happy about that, but um, stayed in the industry because it was so much fun and it was fun much more because of the people than because of, excuse me, the technology or the um, uh, the, the technical problems that we were solving, which at that point was uh, helping rich people get richer in the city of London. Um, but uh, I learned enormous amounts about um, uh, how to build software and how to build software that people actually needed and wanted. Um, and, and, and then as I did that in a series of different startups and companies of, of different sizes, um, uh, I kept getting fired. And I got fired in this very nice way, but over and over again. Uh, and the firing went something like this. Well, Squirrel, you built this great team and they have this great mission and they have a good direction and they deliver frequently and they have a good leader that you've trained and everything seems to be on track, but there's not much for you to do anymore. And gosh, you're kind of expensive. So uh, please go and be wonderful somewhere else. And, and it was really nice. It was really complimentary. And it, uh, I felt good about myself, but I kept getting fired. <laughs> I said, I, I can't continue like this. This doesn't make any sense. So uh, I started to plan for my own obsolescence because the other thing that happened is I had a, a long stint and then a slightly shorter stint and a slightly shorter. So I kept getting faster at getting to this stage where they didn't need me anymore. So I thought maybe I'll plan for that. So uh, now I've worked with um, over 200 different organizations. Um, I, I think I've hit every continent, but Antarctica. Um, so uh, uh, around the world, every kind of industry and uh, helping them to improve their technology and their conversations. And uh, I do that faster and faster. So engagements are now, uh, you know, in the order of weeks rather than months or years. And um, I can really help an organization uh, become, uh, get a huge profit out of its technology in, in a way that um, 
uh, most people can only dream of. So uh, and, that's and a of lot course, of fun to do every day. And of course, that the conversations that you are able to start. That's and... what un unlocks the profit. Exactly. Having and... the right conversations helps you to, to get to the right results, which doesn't have anything to do with bits and bytes and keyboards and, and uh, software. It has to do with people and their interactions. And uh, in the book, you you gave it the title, uh, subtitle rather, Transform Conversations, Transform Your Culture. What do you mean by that? Uh, I mean that if you, um, and uh, again, I'll just draw things from, from life, from, from today. Uh, so I was talking with uh, someone, I'll obscure it a little bit, um, who uh, ha has been missing a conversation with someone in their organization for years and uh, discovered uh, quite by accident that uh, these challenges were present and was now able to go back and say, oh, squirrel, now that I look back and see that we were missing this conversation, this interaction, we didn't have this agreement in place, this common language. Um, uh, if we had only had that two years ago, we could have avoided this mistake and that mistake, and we could have improved here and we could have um, done better and not had this attrition and so on. And uh, if you can fix those conversations, then a lot of the other things become much, much simpler. And the technical barriers these days to most of the things that most of us want to do uh, are, are pretty low. It's not actually that hard to sell something online. It's not actually that hard to um, uh, track somebody's calendar or uh, even to uh, uh, plan a, uh, a, a journey on, uh, what is it, Musk's, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, the, the fancy big one, the Starship. It doesn't actually go to the stars. Even those things, now they're very technically difficult and interesting, but um, they're kind of well understood technology. We kind of know how to light stuff at the bottom of a rocket and make it go up. And, so, and we now have the software and the hardware to do that reliably, repeatedly, and uh, with very little risk, of course. That's why we have space tourism these days. Exactly. But the thing is that uh, people know all that and they can do it, and they still have challenges, and they still have challenges with actually executing. And the challenges aren't with not understanding how to program the computer to do the job. It's all to about what the job is and um, which people should be in charge of uh, uh, what it does. So uh, uh, those are where the challenges are. And that's what I find most interesting. That's why Jeffrey and I wrote the book. Absolutely. And uh, very often those challenges came come rather from uh, uh, missing conversations, as you just mentioned. But one thing that is very interesting for me, and that's also a topic we explored with Judy Rees, is this idea that conversations, like if we think about uh, coaches, scrum masters, team leads, people who usually work through others, right? Like we don't type, we help others type better, the right things, faster, uh, with higher quality, whatever the goal might be. And uh, very often we, we actually miss the tools in order to foster the right type of conversations that then help the people who are actually doing the work that requires information, decision making, resolution of conflicts and, and, and so on and so forth. you know why, Vasco? The, the, most, the most common reason why is uh, people that I coach and I help don't think of conversations as a first order skill. They don't think of, uh, it, it is the topic of a book. Why would someone write a book about conversations? I mean, everybody knows how to talk. You might have uh, remedial talking for somebody like Stephen Hawking who has difficulty with their mouth or tongue, but what, why, why would anyone else need education in conversations? And gosh, we're doing them all day. Here I am having one with Vasco and you know I probably had 20 or 30 this morning, and I'll have four or five more before the end of the day. Why on earth do I do I need more? Well, the problem is that although we do it a lot, we're very bad at it. And uh, and there's evidence of that all around. We can go into some, some uh, examples. But if you think about it, uh, where have you had the greatest difficulties uh, in, in your job in the past year? I bet if you look at them carefully, you'll see that, uh, that the, where it stems from is a, a failure to communicate, a failure to be clear, a failure to understand the other person, a failure of empathy, and those all come from conversations. They don't come from, I didn't know how to do my job, this software didn't work right, um, the, you know, I didn't have enough money for something. Those all are um, things that may happen as a result. But the, uh, the fundamental reason that all those bad things happened is because of the conversations that were missing. So we'll, we'll dive into how to make better, uh, how to get better at conversations in a second. But you called uh, conversations a first order skill. And I wanted mm -hmm. to explain that a little bit further. 
Yeah. So um, uh, we might think of uh, skills that we'd want to improve on the on the job or the things we might spend money on training engineers or uh, product managers or scrum masters or somebody else to do. And, and we might think of things like, well, you said typing. I, I did have one CEO um, uh, who, who knows better now, but he once came to me and said, could we give the engineers typing lessons so we could get more done? And um, uh, I said, you know, that's not actually the major issue. Yes, they should get better at typing, but the, the fundamental skill is not typing. Fundamental skill is typing the right thing. Uh, so, uh, but you might think not only of really mechanical stuff like that, but also uh, learning a new programming language or um, mastering uh, the ins and outs of SAFE or whatever the latest uh, cool uh, agile thing is. I can never keep track of them. It's the title of my book, but I never remember what the, the, the new cool things are. Uh, is it shape up? No, I think I'm still way out of date. Uh, so, uh, you know, learning the latest new thing, um, or uh, is it uh, that you want to train them in, um, uh, uh, I don't know, in your business and things that are relevant to your industry. So if you're in the space industry, you might train them in the rocket equation or something like that. Those are all very good things to train people on. Please spend your money that way. But uh, uh, you should also be considering training them and having better conversations. And no one thinks of that. They don't think to themselves, well, I have a problem I got here is people are not having good enough conversations and I could teach them that. It's a skill that they could learn. Well, it turns out that it is. And there's uh, some uh, very exciting 1970s research, which Jeffrey and I unearthed and uh, is uh, uh, something we heard about and found out th uh, through another guy named uh, Benjamin Mitchell, who's very clever. And uh, uh, that those tools turn out to be really, really useful and valuable, especially for training highly technical people. Because for example, there's one that we cover in the book um, that uh, has a kind of psychology kind of name, which is the ladder of inference. This is a way of building trust with someone through having a better conversation. But uh, uh, we rechristened it uh, test-driven development for people because there's a way of having a conversation that feels kind of as slow and careful and cautious as test-driven development, whether or not you like TDD for your own coding. It's a very helpful analogy, a very helpful way of thinking about having a conversation with someone to slow it down, to make it very um, uh, testable, to check what you're doing as you go and to make sure you're getting the right story. So uh, there are techniques like this uh, that um, uh, are, are well-researched, are, are uh, uh, well-established, um, but nobody seems to actually spend any time on them. So uh, we set out to change that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and do check out the book Agile Conversations. Uh, the link is in the chat if you want to check it out right now. Uh, there you go. It's uh, uh, on the screen as well. And uh, so the ladder of inference is one of the tools. We'll put the link down below so people can go and check it out. But uh, th there are other tools. And, and mm -hmm. now I'm worrying specifically about those of us who might have uh, fallen for the need to uh, follow or implement a certain agile framework and forgotten about how important conversations are, which is something that you were alluding to. Yeah, so think you, about the Scrum conversation Masters. conversation is going to happen wherever you might be, whatever um, framework or tool you might be using, or no tools at all. And um, that's that's one reason mm -hmm. that training and individual skills is valuable, but those are going to fade away. I, I think people will be having conversations, I, I would safely say, for at least another 600 years when this house is standing up. Yeah, absolutely. At least 600 years. Uh, even conversations with machines these days. So, um, and, and those now, can also be done the right there. way and the wrong way. We, uh, we should say more about that. Make sure we do that before we finish, because conversations with machines is a very interesting new idea that, of course, we didn't have so much of when we wrote the book. So, All right. So before we go to the conversations with machines, so stick around. We will talk about let's that in a stick second. To people, stick to people first. Go on. Yeah, let's go to people first. And, and uh, now speaking to coaches and scrum masters who are out there helping teams get the right things done faster with faster feedback and, you know, more impact for the business. At least that's uh, as the saying goes, that's the goal. Right. What are some of the tools that you mentioned in the book and also maybe tools that you've uh, discovered and developed later that can help us have more productive and insightful conversations with our teams first and then with also our stakeholders? Yep. So um, I'll mention one or two and um, we can get into more if it's helpful. There's, excuse me, lots and lots of different techniques and models and things in the book. Um, which I'm not trying to sell anyone, by the way. Uh, I'm happy if you buy it, but you also can 
join Squirrel Squadron and hear from me about it every week and stuff like that. So there's there's lots of ways to find out this uh, get, get this material. But um, uh, one that I really like that's come up uh, again recently more and more is um, joint design. So uh, what often happens in a design process where you're designing anything, um, it might be you're designing a piece of software, but uh, you might also be designing a new process or uh, addressing a customer need or um, trying to figure out what you're going to do in your next sprint. What often happens is uh, you've got uh, someone who's more powerful, someone who has a louder voice, and uh, the de decisions get made by that person. But uh, there's never any uh, meaningful feedback from others. And you see this a lot in quite large organizations where um, uh, I was just very frustrated with someone this morning because he said, oh, yes, we're waiting for our new hire who will be six months away before we do anything about this problem. Uh, and when, when that person comes, they'll tell us what to do. I said, yeah, but you got the problem for the next six months. And you probably have the solution to the problem in your organization. If you talk to me, I could help you unlock it. So the process of joint design is one in which you have some concern, you have something, a decision ultimately that you want to make, but you don't want to do it in a unilateral way. You want to do it in a way that encourages more information to flow and uh, alternatives to come up. And of course, when it, this all sounds like motherhood and apple pie, I'm sure everyone says, yeah, well, we do that. Yeah, that's exactly how we do it. That's that's how you want to do it. It's obvious that what you'd want if you uh, have a, an organization that's making a decision is to get everybody's point of view. They might see things differently, get really diverse points of view uh, to make sure that you solicit people who disagree and disagreement would be really, really useful uh, and then make a decision based on all the information that's available. That's what everybody says. That's what nobody does. So if you look around your organization, you will see countless examples where someone makes a decision unilaterally or with a small group or um, uh, does so having heard a bunch of information but not listened to it. And uh, then you wonder why the, the decisions uh, get made so poorly. Well, joint design gives you a framework for doing this. And very briefly, um, you specifically involve a larger group of people than you might naturally. You um, uh, solicit opposing points of view. You make it clear where the decision is going to be made, because this is not kind of um, death by analysis, where you spend uh, months and months uh, discussing and arguing about something. You say there's going to be a decision, but it's going to involve everybody. We're going to make sure that we've heard all the different points of view. Uh, and there are techniques that you can work on uh, uh, along the way to make sure that you are including all of those ideas and points of view uh, as effectively as possible. So, um, uh, uh, and you you time box the decision and make sure there's a clear decision maker. That's uh, 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 other important points. Now, this this seems like it might be fairly obvious, and you say, "Gosh, squirrel, you know, I can kind of figure out how to do that." Go try it. And you'll see actually how difficult it is because everyone says they want to do it, but actually making it happen is challenging. And so the key thing in the book, you know, Vasco, there are two different types of people who read this book. There are people who read it and they say, Squirrel, that was so fun to read. It really had nice ideas in it. I really enjoyed it. And I know they didn't read it very carefully. That's okay. I'm happy with people like that. The publisher is really happy. They bought the book. They don't care. Um, but there is another group of people who say, this was a really hard book to read. I had to work really hard at it and I had to think hard and my brain is tired. And, you know, why'd you make me work that hard? And, and those people get more out of it because the book has throughout it um, conversational analysis techniques so that you can go to a place where, say, you tried some joint design or you tried doing test driven development and find out all the things you screwed up. And realize, and it's it's quite a humbling experience to, to write down one of these conversations and to mark it up in, in the way that we describe and, and to score yourself and to get a very low score, maybe zero, and to say, wow, I really thought I was good at this. Actually, I suck. Uh, and of course, that's the first place where uh, you can uh, begin to improve is when you understand what things you're not doing well. Uh, and so what this, was the name of this uh, self-evaluation framework? Uh, well, it's conversational analysis. We've called it different things. Um, it can be called a two-column case study. Um, that's what it was called by the originator of uh, a lot of these ideas, a guy named Chris Argyris, a um, social science uh, professor, I think at Yale, maybe Harvard, um, in the 70s. Um, but that's that's not a very evocative name. So we, we tend to call it a conversational analysis, that it involves writing down what you said, what the other person said, and what you thought but didn't say. And, and often that's most... Um, uh, telling, because you'll be thinking something like, well, that's a dumb idea, but I guess I'll listen to him until he's done talking. 
And once you realize that that's what you think you're thinking, you realize that you're probably not doing very much joint design because you're waiting to uh, to say your piece or to um, uh, to get to something that's meaningful. To, or you, yeah, to you. you're you're trying to influence the other instead of trying to create shared and perhaps different knowledge from what you started with. Exactly. And what you're aiming for, and this is very hard to do, I fail at it all the time, and uh, you know, I've been studying this stuff for, for many, many years, is um, uh, being willing to change your mind, to go into a conversation and say, there's something I can, I'll probably learn here that will change the thought I have coming in. So I don't let my coaching clients, for example, um, think about or talk about the word convince. I just tell them, you eliminate that word from your vocabulary. You're not going to convince anyone. What you're going to do is uh, go in and listen and and uh, discover something that's new. And if you discover something that's new, it may not change your mind very much. It may not change your mind at all, but make sure that you learn something from the conversation. And if they uh, go in with that point of view, then they start to notice things. And this comes up from the conversational analysis too, things like not asking any questions. So it's very hard to learn things and to discover something new if you never ask the other person any questions, but it's very common to have a conversation in which you say, let me tell you my point of view. Let me tell you the information that I gathered. Let me tell you what happened at the meeting yesterday. And you're doing an awful lot of telling and no asking. So that's- yeah, and, and that's such a simple uh, kind of, uh, how do you say, self-check uh, point, right? Like, uh, did I ask questions in this yes. conversation? Yeah. And it's astonishing how many conversations, if you really analyze them, if you really look at them, you will find have no questions in them at all. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Chris Argyris's work, Knowledge for Action, was one of the books I read way back when. And uh, wow, it's, you uh, made it through Knowledge for Action! Congratulations. Yes. Yeah, I, you deserve I was, an award. That's tough. I was that I was that deep into it at the time. So um, good for you. Uh, and it was because yeah, I don't was. Don't worry, facing... everybody. You don't have to read Knowledge for Action. It's no, you have Squirrel's Agile Conversations forward. book. Go for that yeah, and, first. And others by Argyris's followers. So we <clears> we don't have the own. We don't have a monopoly. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah he, absolutely. he's tough going. He's, he's really rough. Uh, I had to find a, a, a used book on Amazon because there was no print print of that book anymore. The, but the, the demand the, is not huge. The demand is not huge, as you say. But uh, the the um, the reason why I ended up uh, reading Argyris, of course, was that, that I was facing the same problem that you described, right? Like I was having conversations that were not being productive, that led to conflict, led to lack of decision making, led to delays instead of shared understanding, shared goals and, and joint decision making. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned, you teased, I should say, a minute ago, talking or conversations with machines. And I know oh, you've been thinking about that. So tell us a little bit more about that. Well, here's um, one of the latest developments couldn't possibly have been in the book because we didn't we didn't have it at the time. If uh, IT Revolution wants a second edition, we'll definitely have to include a section on this. We have invented these amazing tools. We, humanity, have invented these amazing tools that many of us are now playing with called large language models, things like chat GPT and so on. And we're playing with them all wrong. So we haven't discovered some of the, the really valuable things they can do. And, and the very most valuable one, I think, that I'm telling all my clients about and encouraging my uh, people on coaching to, to, to use is um, the ability to have the computer be a troop of actors, not just one actor, but a troop. So it can, it can um, pretend to be multiple conversation partners, or you could start with just one. That would probably be easier. And it can be the toughest one you can imagine. So uh, I was on a, a sales podcast with uh, Colleen Francis, who's a world famous, fantastic salesperson. And um, I, I was telling her, you know, all your, your listeners here, all your salespeople could be practicing with their toughest customers. Of course, their job is, is all conversations, right? So that's uh, all they do is convince people. They really are convincing people to, to buy stuff. And um, uh, the, the machine can pretend to be a customer who has um, an objection based on money or a, a, a customer who has an objection based on time or a customer who's had a bad experience with you before. And you can give it a bunch of instructions about your product and what how it works and so on and uh, have it actually in real time give you responses like that customer and you can practice. And of course, if you screw up, you get to try it again. This is a technique that salespeople use all the time. Of course, they they practice and they... they uh, 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 hone their pitches and so on, but uh, humans get bored and humans don't uh, consistently give uh, uh, consistent re results and, and answers and so on. Machine will never get bored. It'll keep talking with you. 
And uh, similarly, uh, if your concerns, you say you're a, a, an agile uh, team member, and you, you think that uh, it's very difficult to talk to uh, managers about um, your agile goals and um, uh, uh, experimenting and, and iterating rather than working to a, a fixed schedule. Well, you can have the uh, machine be a uh, intransigent manager, worse than the actual people that you're going to encounter. Someone who is uh, uh, fixated, loves Gantt charts, um, really wants uh, everything uh, carefully planned out for the next 12 months. And um, uh, see what your interaction is like with them. For example, figure out if you can manage to ask them any questions. You might be so annoyed that you keep saying you're an idiot and you never ask any questions. But then you can see that and you can try again and try again and try again. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there's a ton of different startups and people building on top of this stuff, and the, the, you can find more chatbots than you can imagine. But there's very few, uh, fewer than I'd like doing this. One I know is called character.ai. And uh, uh, one thing, of course, they do that's kind of fun and silly is you can have a conversation with Isaac Newton or, or Stephen Hawking or, or someone like that. Uh, you know, Genghis Khan uh, as your as your. Oh, that's that partner. would be interesting. Genghis Khan as the CEO or the CTO. That See, that would be cool. You could use one of those, but but I think the more valuable way to use that tool or any other is by coming up with your own prompt that's relevant to your situation. And um, the the value of practice is huge. That's something we banged on about hugely in the book, and and really want people to exercise and practice and try. That's the the hard work of the book. Um, but uh, the computer can make that a lot easier by um, uh, being as and safer, and difficult and challenging, and, and it's safer, right? You don't have to worry that uh, uh, you'll screw it up and, and anger your boss. Computer will not fire you. Computer. Com or maybe I, I, not I, yet. Not yet. I'm, I, I don't think that's coming anytime soon. So we have a question from the chat. Uh, oh, great. Sergio Posetti, who's uh, also a speaker at the summit. Mm -hmm. So check out his, his talk as well. Um, he says, about the decision maker role, obviously joint design needs to progress and I do see the need for one, but how does one avoid the anti-pattern whereby this role is a hippo, which stands for highest paid person, of course, in the room, uh, slash loudest voice. So how do we overcome that anti-pattern? Well, you could do that in lots of ways, and it depends on how enlightened your organization is and how much power you have. So um, uh, a wonderful way to do it is to make it uh, not the obvious person. So I remember um, at a, one of those companies where I was CTO, um, we uh, uh, put in charge of our product direction, the uh, person who did our quality assurance, the person who did our testing. Now, she was not the most senior person. She certainly wasn't the loudest person. But boy, did she know how to break our system. And she knew everything that could go wrong. And resilience was very important. So um, uh, we had a little process where people would come and bring petitions to her. And they'd say, would you, and it's a process called petition, the, in her case, the queen or the king. Um, and, and they would come and say, would you, we should build this. And she'd say, oh, I'm not convinced. And then they'd come back again and, and ask again. Um, and so she was our decision maker for um, contentious projects, things that we weren't sure whether we should build or not. Um, and because she had a view of the whole system and she had a view of it that was very different from the rest of us, we got very interesting decisions. So that's one method, um, but you need a lot of power there. You need a lot of ability. Um, the, the CEO might not be very happy if you put the, someone else in charge uh, and you might not be the CEO. So um, the, the other thing to do is to have a difficult conversation with the person who might be making the decision. Um, and uh, invite them to learn about joint design, invite them to, to think about it differently, to work differently, maybe even to practice with you and to accept feedback. Now that's challenging and difficult. That's um, a harder thing to do than to gripe about it around the water cooler or on Slack or wherever people- And, and also, yeah. if I understand you correctly, like you were referring to like practice joint design without yes. the, the need and the pressure to make a decision right then and there, but mm -hmm. rather as part of the learning process of learning how to do joint design. It, it would be great if you could pick us maybe slightly less contentious or less urgent issue to practice on first with that decision. Or, or even a past decision. Yeah, you could revisit it. That's a good idea. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, of course, the, the, the goal here is to learn to create and foster uh, positive conversations that, that, as you said, help the information flow better in the organization and ultimately have um, uh, a, a wider set of thoughts and ideas that are considered when making decisions. 
Uh, one other aspect that I explored with Judy, and I really want to hear your thoughts on that, is this idea that for us as Scrum Masters and Agile coaches, people who work with change all the time, we need to be aware that there are multiple layers of conversation, like one conversation isn't just one conversation, right? Like, for example, if we're talking to uh, uh, a development team about test-driven development, we're talking about that, right? Test-driven development. We're also talking about collaboration between the team members. We're also talking about uh, how to improve quality overall. We're also talking about uh, the need to agree on certain standards. Like, there's many different conversations that kind of merge, right? They mesh yep. into even seemingly simple topics like adopting test-driven development. Uh, how do you do that? Like, how do you keep track of what are all of the conversations you're having in your role as a change agent, which you also are as a consultant? Oh, well, that's even more complicated. So I thought you were going to ask me how could people who are listening to us do that. But if you ask how I do it, um, uh, I have to reflect on that for a moment. Um, I, I tend to be a reductionist. So uh, I tend to be someone who... Um, you know, one of my favorite words is the word reification, which is a fancy word that simply means putting things in buckets. It means taking some horribly complicated, weird phenomenon that has all these um, uh, multiple layers and, and confusion and um, uh, overlapping concerns and um, separating it out into, into relevant areas. And I think that's one of, one of my better skills. That's one that I really apply all the time. So um, for example, uh, I'll just keep doing examples because I, I think they that that's one way of reifying is sort of um, catching hold of an idea and putting it in a bucket and saying it's it's this example. So one that uh, uh, came up earlier today was uh, someone who was describing a conflict with uh, uh, somebody else in in his team, and he he sent me a screed. He sent me this long email with uh, you know this happened and this happened and there's the other thing and there's that one, and I said um, well I, I think we can put this in a bucket. You can put this in the bucket of uh, this person is fixing to leave. This person is is not sticking around with you. And if we look at all of these things through that lens, how does that look? And the person said, yeah, that seems about right. Seems like this person's not long for the company. So I said, well, we better figure out how we replace them because this is not working. Um, so uh, I get that kind of uh, uh, question and, and um, uh, concern often. And that's not always the answer. There was another one earlier today where that wasn't the answer. And, and so... Uh, you have to apply quite a lot of judgment and knowledge and experience to, to get um, useful reification. But um, uh, uh, what I'm, I'm looking for is um, separating the conversations and making them tractable for my um, uh, uh, relatively small brain. Um, there's a great uh, example from code. Um, and I can't remember who it is. I'd love to give him credit. And if somebody knows, please put it in the chat. But there's someone who says, you know, what I need is to make sure that every piece of code, every function I write, every unit that I'm testing should fit in my head. And you kind of hear that and you think, oh, okay, fit in your head, you know, something you can comprehend or kind of get your brain around. He doesn't mean that. He means his physical head. He means putting his physical head up to the screen and measuring that it's no bigger than his actual head when it's <laughs> in the screen. So um, I, I need the conversation to be simple enough that it fits in my head, maybe not that way, but uh, more more abstractly. Uh, so uh, reification is my method. Absolutely. All right, we're, we're getting close to the end, uh, Squirrel. We could uh, oh, go no. on with this conversation for a long time, uh, could, of course. Man. Yeah, but uh, uh, we 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 do need to kind of uh, wrap things up, and and obviously one of the things that uh, people should check out is Agile Conversations, the book. The link is in the chat, and will be later on in the description below. There you go. Uh, Squirrel is sharing it on Jeffrey's the screen. Name. I want to make sure he gets credit. Yeah, and Jeffrey Frederick, also the yep. co-author of the book. Yes. But uh, um, uh, besides the book, which we will put in the links below, uh, if you could recommend a resource, could be a video, a, a podcast, a blog, or, or even a book uh, about the topic of conversations in organizations uh, related to change, but also related to other things, uh, what would that be? Oh, very interesting. So I didn't come ready for one of those. I know you have a podcast, which I've been on, so you should certainly listen to Vasco. That's one. I'm going to give you more than one here because I, I, I don't think I, uh, I have a, a single... <clears throat> Uh, single one to look at. Um, oh, I'll tell you a video. I'll tell you a video that's absolutely life changing. Uh, it's and it's from a completely less healed place. You wouldn't expect it. 
Uh, there's a guy called Xavier Amador, A-M-A-D-O-R, and Xavier is the um, slightly unusual name that starts with an X. Um, and, and he works with um, severely disturbed um, uh, schizophrenics, people who believe that um, aliens from the moon are controlling their brains and shooting lasers out of their eyes, you know, that kind of stuff. That for people are really literally on a different planet mentally. Um, and he helps them to take medica medication that they really don't want. And, and he talks quite extensively, just look him up on YouTube. He has a, a couple really good talks um, in which he describes how he helps these people to um, completely change their lives by listening to them and uh, accepting what he can. So he, he's not going to accept that the CIA is is um, controlling your toilet and sending messages to your neighbors or you know whatever thing that person believes that's due to their disease. But he does agree with them about how terrifying that is and how it means they can't sleep. And, and he has a whole process, uh, which we don't have time for here, but it's just amazing to, to learn about and to, to understand, um, for listening, empathizing, agreeing, and partnering. He calls it LEAP. Um, and, and he helps these people who, who don't think they're ill. That's the main thing. Is they think they're perfectly fine. They think there is no problem, and therefore they don't need medicine. Why would they need medicine? They're fine. You got to deal with the CIA, right? The aliens are the problem. Um, uh, but he helps them to see that uh, medicine could help them without tricking them, without, you know, he's not coercive or, or uh, manipulative, um, but he really genuinely helps people. Now, if you think that uh, it's really difficult to deal with, say, your boss or the um, the product team or the, the difficult customer, try a, a psychotic person. Uh, yeah, and yeah. He can do it. For, you probably can, too. So Mo uh, Most bosses don't believe in aliens, so or, or at least not in a way that would affect the conversations at work. Not consciously. Some of them seem like they do, but um, it, not, <laughs> not, not so. And, and I always, of course, have to mention Troubleshooting Agile, which is uh, Jeffrey's and my podcast, which we just did our 300th episode of. So, um, Absolutely. And we'll put well. the link to that podcast also uh, below so that people can go and, and, and check it out. Uh, I mean, it's been a pleasure. Um, Likewise. Uh, there, there's been a, a lot of tips in this uh, session, so you can go back. It's I think it's like 45 minutes or so conversation. Went by like that. Yeah, yeah it went by like that. So uh, check it out, of course. Um, but um, if you would leave us with one last parting word of advice, Squirrel, what would that be? When you're not sure what to do, ask a question, because not enough people ask questions. And if you if you use that as your watchword, and and you increase the number of questions that you ask, genuine questions where you really want the answer, not questions like Vasco, wouldn't you like to adopt Shape Up? Wouldn't you like to start that tomorrow? That's not a genuine question. Questions like Vasco, uh, do, do you think our current process is working? That would be a more genuine question. Uh, if you increase the number of genuine questions you ask, um, that alone will make your conversations much much better. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great parting words of advice. We'll put the links to uh, Squirrel Squadron, the community right. that Squirrel facilitates and, and writes to every week. Uh, lots of tips coming to you if you join that. We do a free event every week. Yeah, and a free along, event every week. Ask questions, yeah. Absolutely. So we'll put the link in the show notes. Uh, Squirrel, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your generosity with your time and your